we have finally arrived. We are on the 12th movement <clears throat> of 12 movements through the whole of Scripture for Panorama of the Bible. And we are on page 208 in our workbooks. For mastery of Panorama of the Bible, you need to understand and have a working knowledge of the 12 basic movements. Beginning with the prologue, all the way to the patriarchs, redemption and wandering, to the conquest, to the apostasy, to the kingship united, to the kingship divided, to the exile, to the return of the exile, to the uh, life of Christ, to the church age, to today, which is the uh, final consummation. How does human history end? How does the plan of the ages all come together? And as we are looking for mastery of the breadth of Scripture, focus on not only those movements, <clears throat> but also focus on the panorama timeline. Uh, we have that in full for you in the first few pages of the workbook. Today we will be completing it, and you'll notice, <clears throat> excuse me, on page 208, at the top of the page, by way of review, movements 1 to 9 deals with what we call the Old Testament. Testamentum, or covenant, the Old Covenant, whereas uh, uh, movements uh, 10 through 12 deal with what we commonly call the New Testament. We have listed for you the timelines for movement 10, Life of Christ, Movement 11, the church age, and as you turn the page, at the top of the page, we are ready to begin movement number 12. But before we provide a timeline, uh, there's, there are several ways this may end. <clears throat> and this is where scholars generally generate more heat than light. Uh, we argue a lot about end-time events. And I think on the front end, it's only fair to say that when we come to prophetic Scripture, we ought to come with a certain humility. Uh, in the first century, the uh, religious leaders of the day missed the coming of the Messiah, and yet it was right there in the Scripture. Sometimes prophetic events are much clearer in the rearview mirror than they are out the front windshield. In other words, trying to anticipate what's going to happen and how it's going to happen and the unfolding events of how it's going to happen is much more difficult to see from Scripture than when we see fulfilled prophecy and we go, of course, uh, Bethlehem was the birthplace of the Messiah. Of course, he would be born of a virgin and so forth. So we have to come to it with a certain sense of humility. I guess what I'm trying to say is this. You and I may disagree. And if we disagree, you're wrong. <clears throat> or maybe I'm wrong. Or maybe both of us are wrong. But the Scripture is not. And so as we approach the Scripture, we're doing our best thinking. We're doing our best understanding in order to get our uh, hands around, our arms around, this, uh, this whole idea of how does this all end up? How does the church age, which we are in now, how does it finish up in God's great kingdom program? Well, at the top of the uh, page 209, <clears throat> we come to the book of Revelation. It is our basic textbook, but you can't understand Revelation without help from the book of Daniel, and also without help probably from Ezekiel, uh, Zechariah, and uh, some of the other uh, prophets of the Old Testament. When you come to the book of Revelation, there are four ways you can look at it. As a matter of fact, I want you to think of it as there are four distinct pairs of glasses that you can pick up and put on, and whatever pair of glasses you pick, that's going to lead you in your interpretation. So you want to make sure you pick up the right pair of glasses. <clears throat> Historically, there have been four pairs of glasses through which people read and interpret the book of Revelation. And this is so foundational, let's take a look at it so that you get a sense of what biblical scholars have believed through the uh, ages. Number one is preterist. Uh, that's the past. That's our key word, therefore, for the past view. Notice how it's defined. All the prophecies of Revelation have been, here's the key idea, fulfilled in the early history, most likely by 70 A.D. and the destruction of Jerusalem by the uh, Roman legions. So a person who puts on his preterist glasses is going to say all of that symbolism and those bowls and those judgments and, and trumpets and all of that stuff, all of that was symbolic language, and it was all fulfilled in early church history. Jesus dies in the 30s, perhaps around uh, 
uh, 33 A.D., and uh, from 33 A.D. until 70 A.D., all of the book of Revelation somehow symbolically is fulfilled uh, in that period of time. That's the preterist view. And I gave you some uh, biblical scholars who hold very strongly to that view. There's also a view called the historical view, which sees the book of Revelation, the key idea here is present. They say all of those, all of those uh, uh, prophecies or, or all of the book of Revelation is the unfolding church history throughout all of the ages. Church history has lasted 2,000 years, and the book of Revelation is unfolding all of church uh, history through the prophecies of Revelation, primarily 6 through 19. <clears throat> You'll see uh, the Reformers, like Luther, was what would be known as a historical view person. Uh, Jean Calvin uh, was that way as well. Uh, the idealist view, which I think is the least tenable. I mean, I just, I really have a hard time seeing this view. But the idea here is timeless, that Revelation is really not speaking of actual events, but it's just in, in symbolic apocalyptic language. It's talking about the historic struggles of good versus bad, light versus darkness, the church age undergoing persecution, and there are no true fulfillments. It's just all symbolic language to say the church age is going to have hardship. Church age is going to have persecution. The church age is going to have difficulties. Now, that's true, but I'm not sure that, that the book of Revelation is supporting the idealist view. Well, though you have some proponents, even the great church father Augustine, who was probably influenced by the allegorist uh, origin and others, uh, believed in this. The idea is imagery and timeless struggle. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and tip my hand. Uh, you know, when, you, when you're playing theological poker, you never lay your hands down. But I'm going to go ahead and tip my hand. Uh, I wear the fourth pair of glasses. I see the book of Revelation from a futurist viewpoint. Key word, future. And you'll notice that in my view, pr the prophecies of Revelation 4 to 22 have not yet been fulfilled. And, uh, and are still waiting uh, a fulfillment. And so for me, <clears throat> I am going to use what is known as the literal hermeneutic, which means the literal approach to interpreting the Scripture. I'm going to attempt to see things uh, literally unless they don't, just simply don't make sense. And the illustration we often use is even a literal interpreter uh, understands that the Bible has figurative language. But when we can, we're going to try to interpret it literally. For example... There's a passage that says, the eye of the Lord moves to and fro around the earth. Okay, does that mean God, from a literal point of view, is a huge eyeball orbiting the planet? Well, no. Uh, it, it, that's not what it means. That is, that is uh, figurative literal language. In other words, using metaphors or symbolic language to make a literal point. And so it, it means that God knows everything that's going on around the earth. Well, I'm going to attempt to see things literally, and if that doesn't make sense, we'll look for a metaphorical uh, uh, meaning as well. So, <clears throat> I will see Revelation 4 to 22 as yet future. Now, if you turn to the next page, we, <clears throat> immediately when you start talking about prophecy and end time events, you come up to this word called millennium, and it's defined for you on the top of page 210. The word millennium is from a Latin word, mille, which means literally thousand. It refers to the thousand-year reign of Christ uh, found in Revelation chapter 20. And I've given you a portion of that text. Let's look at it. Revelation 20, verse 4. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those. Now, who are the those that we're talking about? It either means the twelve, or it's referring to uh, church-age saints, those to whom authority to judge was committed, and I saw the souls of those, those who go through the tribulation, those believers in the tribulation, who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. Those who had not worshipped the beast or its image had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life, that's a resurrection, and they reigned with Christ. Notice the bold print. How long? Thousand years. That's where we get our word, thousand, mille, from the Latin, millennium. In other words, if you take it literally, 
you believe <clears throat> that there will be a resurrection and that there will be a period of a, a thousand year reign where Christ literally reigns on the earth, yet future for a thousand years, to fulfill ancient Old Testament Hebrew prophecy. All right? And that's the basic view, and it's the basic view that I'm following. You'll notice that thousand years is, is found three times in this passage, all, all of them bold in your workbook. Now, here's where the theological debate occurs, and that is, how do you take that thousand years? If, uh, if a person is, uh, follows the camp called amillennialism, that A in front of millennialism negates the word millennium. It's what's known as an alpha privative in the Greek language. It just sim simply you say the word no. So there is no millennium. So those who say, hey, I am an amillennialist, I do not believe there will be a literal thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. I, uh, I, I think symbolically it just refers to Christ is going to rule and reign in people's hearts, and there is no reign of Christ from Jerusalem, from the land of Israel. There is no fulfillment of the Davidic covenant in a literal sense. It's all spiritualized. It's a spiritual thing. So I see no, kingdom, no uh, literal thousand-year reign, no Davidic kingdom. That's the amillennialist. By the way, <clears throat> I was trained, one of my degrees was from an amillennial school. So I have a, I have a sense of indebtedness for the uh, education I received at that seminary, but I do, I do not uh, embrace the amillennial view. Just going to let you know on the front end. Postmillennial, the word post means after. This is a way of saying that Christ is going to return after the millennium. But the millennium doesn't have to be a thousand years. It just simply means that after a, a long period of time, Christ will return. And during that millennial kingdom, things are going to get better and better and better. Why? Because the gospel will be preached to all nations. And as all nations come to faith in Christ, it will have a leavening, a good leavening effect a good purifying effect on culture and society. And the post-millennialists, particularly in the 19th century, the post-millennialists said that due to the church and the growing of the church and the influence of the church, things are going to get better and better and better and better. And you know what happened? The First World War. Wow, it's kind of hard to see things get... Then the Second World War, followed by the Korean War, followed by the Vietnam War followed by wars and rumors of war, as Jesus would say, that have plagued this planet. We have had precious few years historically that there was not warfare and battle, battles going on somewhere in the world. So for a post to say, uh, we're going to bring Jesus back as things get better and better and better, is probably very, very optimistic and somewhat of somewhat a denial of true historical facts. So the post-millennialist says, the golden age will be ushered in by the preaching of the gospel. But folks, that's just not the case. So now we come to the third view, <clears throat> which would be the view that I would lean into, and that is that Christ is going to return to set up and establish His thousand-year reign. And that is your basic premillennialism. premillennialism. Pre means before the millennium. So at some point, yet future, Christ returns and He establishes the thousand-year reign in fulfillment of ancient Old Testament prophecies. For example, like 2 Samuel chapter 7, a descendant of David would rule over the throne of the house of Israel forever. And so that's where the basic premillennial view is. Now, we premillennialists are a, we're like a herd of cats. You, you cannot pin us down or get us all to agree on anything. So of premillennialists, there are all kinds of varieties. Uh, for example, there are some who say that Christ will return for the church in what you, we would call the secret rapture, where the, the, uh, the church of Jesus Christ, those who have commit, committed their lives in faith to Him, who are members of His body, we, the church, are raptured into heaven That'll commence a seven-year tribulation period. Then Christ will return in the second coming to establish His kingdom. So those people are called premillennial, but they're called pre-before the tribulation. So Christ comes before the tribulation. He comes after the tribulation to establish the thousand-year reign. Make sense? At least that's the view, all right? Then others say, no, 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 no. 
He comes in the middle of the tribulation. So Christ comes in the middle of the tribulation. The church is taken into heaven. At the end of that now three and a half year period, he comes back, establishes the kingdom in fulfillment of ancient prophecy. And the post millennialist says, hmm, or the post tribulationalist says, no, 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 no. No, Christ is going to come at the end of the tribulation. Therefore, the church goes through the tribulation period described in Revelation 6 to 19. It is not, uh, it's not too good to go through the tribulation, and it will go through the tribulation of seven years. Then Christ will rapture his church, and then they will come down to establish the kingdom all in one big event. To my mind, a bit inefficient, but anyway, that's the post tribulational view. We get raptured up, then we come right down, and then we start and establish the millennial kingdom. All right, let's turn the page. Uh, in fact, I want you to jump all the way. Uh, there's a comparison chart on page 211, but we want to jump to page 212 and look at the actual book of Revelation. And I'm going to show you why I follow the uh, premillennial and also the pre-tribulational view. All right? Revelation chart on the top of page 212. Notice that the theme of the book of Revelation is given in the first chapter. Jesus says it very simply to John. John, write therefore, number one, what you have seen. That was described in chapter one of the book of Revelation. Then I want you to write, uh, I want you to describe what you have seen uh, that is now. In other words, what is happening in the uh, first century in the, uh, in the world, and that is the seven letters to the seven churches. Jesus basically picks out seven representative churches and gives an analysis and evaluation of those churches. So that is what is now. So write what you have seen, what is now, first century, then notice this, and what will take place later, that is to say, yet in the future, which would be chapters 4 to 22. Chapters 4 to 19, more specifically 6 to 19, because 4 and 5 is a throne room scene in heaven. But chapters 6 to 19 describes the events of the tribulation, a seven-year period of time that fulfills the 70th week of Daniel 9, which we looked at earlier. The millennium is that thousand-year reign. We've already looked at a passage from Revelation 20 on the millennium, thousand-year reign. Then the eternal state is described in Revelation 21 and 22 as the book ends. What we discover is we began in a garden. We messed it up. God has a program of redemption. We end in a garden, and everything's uh, hunky-dory. That's a Hebrew word for as it should be. All right. <clears throat> now, if you'll turn the page, we want to look uh, on page 213, our biblical exposition of Revelation. We have our Theme verse, once again, Revelation 1, 19. Write, therefore, what you have seen, Revelation 1. What is now the churches on the planet, uh, seven particular churches. What is now seven churches uh, of Revelation 2 and 3. And what will happen later, what's yet future. So let's look at the what we have seen, Revelation 1. Revelation 1, verse 1. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must take place soon, or what must soon take place. Now, please understand that that word soon did not mean immediately. I mean, 2,000 years almost have passed, right? So it doesn't mean soon in the way we say soon. Uh, what it means is, is uh, it's not soon in quick time events. It means speedily once they begin. In other words, the idea is the dominoes are stacked up, and when you kick the first domino over, then things soon, all of these events described in chapters 4 to 19, all of them will happen in rapid-fire fashion. All right? So that's the idea of, of soon. Otherwise, the book of Revelation has, makes no sense because Christ did not come back uh, soon, <clears throat> and, and what would happen so, uh, notice verse 3, blessed then is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. It's the only book in the New Testament where the writer says specifically, you'll be blessed if you read it, blessed if you uh, study it, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart. You'll notice the instructions, Revelation 1, verse 9 through 11, John is writing this revelation that he received in, re in chapter 1. He was on the island of Patmos. I'm just thinking back, uh, Mickey Rapier and I and some of our people here at Fellowship, we were on the island of uh, Patmos not too long ago, 
on a Journeys of Paul visit. If you'll look on the other side of the page, page 214, there's a, a map. And at the bottom of the map, more towards the left-hand side, you'll notice that Patmos is an island off the western coast of Greece, south, southwest of uh, the, land, uh, the city of Ephesus. You see where Patmos is? So that's where, <clears throat> that's where this... That's where John was living, that's where he was exiled to, when he received this revelation of what would take place. Uh, <clears throat> you'll also notice, uh, with, since we're on that page with that map, you'll notice that there are seven letters to seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. These are historical churches. They were real churches, and the events and the, uh, the words that are spoken to them were very real to their day in the first century. But not only that, these are representative churches. And by that we mean what Christ would commend a church for in the first century, do you think He would commend it today? Absolutely. So if He says, uh, <clears throat> I'm aware that you work hard and that's good, do you think uh, today He would say to a church, I'm, a, I'm aware that you work hard and, and that's good? Yes. So whatever Christ would commend in the first century, he would commend today in the 21st century. But hear this. Whatever he would condemn in the first century, do you think he would condemn today? So if we took the, the first church, Ephesus, he says, I know your deeds. I want you to keep doing what you've been doing. But then he said this by way of condemnation. He said, I got one thing against you, Ephesus. You left your first love, your first love for Christ. So, what Christ would condemn in the first century, you lost your purity of devotion for Jesus. He would also condemn today. Therefore, church leaders, church people, read Revelation 2 and 3, not just as history, how good those churches were and how bad those churches were, but we have a template by which we can judge our churches of today, our churches of the 21st century. And so we would have to ask, in light of the letter to the church at Ephesus, we would have to ask ourselves here at Fellowship or any other church today, we would have to ask ourselves, have we lost our first love for Christ? My view is if we have, we better renew it or close up shop. Because if, you've lo if you lose the purpose and the meaning for the church, then there's really no purpose for having an, a religious organization. We want to have a body of believers who are passionate about the person of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, why are we here? So, good lessons to be learned. If you'll turn the page, I've summarized, oh, my heart just flutters, a chart. We have a whole page chart in which I, we take the, all seven churches, uh, and I give, basically, I summarize by way of topic and by way of a theme each of those seven churches, and then a key relevant question that we could ask about personal life or our family life or ministry life. We've been picking on Ephesus, so let's look at it. Ephesus is a church that slides. The theme, leaving our first love. The key question, is Christ central in my life? Smyrna was the church that suffered. They were going undergoing distress and persecution. The theme here for the church of Smyrna is suffering for our faith. And the key question for me, relevant question for me is, would I be faithful in suffering? Would I be faithful even to the point of death? There are men and women who are giving their lives for the cause of Christ because they will not deny Him. And therefore, they are suffering a martyr's death. <clears throat> An organization... Uh, that tracks this says that there are more people being martyred for their faith today than ever have been martyred in the history of the church. And it just asks a real relevant question. I think it's really rough when maybe I'm at the office, in the corporate office, and somebody finds out I'm a Christian and they make fun of me. Is that suffering for Jesus? Not in light of what some are facing and being strong in enduring even to the point of death throughout the world. So the seven letters to the seven churches, 
uh, these seven letters to these seven churches not only provide a template uh, of what was, but also a template of what should be. And it's a great study uh, for men and women to uh, fill out uh, a little bit more of the detail. Let's turn the page. What will take place later? Uh, remember we said Revelation 1, what, what you have seen, Revelation 2 and 3, what is now, the first century churches, and then what will take place later in the future. That's Revelation 4 to 22. And we finally come to the panorama timeline, how does it end? And I gave you six options. So you pick one, and there's your panorama timeline. Uh, I'm going to tell you mine is the first one, and there's a word uh, missing. Beneath premillennial, in the final consummation chart on page uh, 216, beneath premillennial, we should write the word pre-tribulational. Because again, I'm laying my theological cards on the table and letting you know, this is what I believe the Scripture is best, or best represents the teaching of the whole of Scripture. What that means is, let's see if we can walk through the chart with all these little goofy arrows and everything. <clears throat> the premillennial, this is the first view here, the premillennial, pre-tribulational view. Notice Israel's in the Old Testament, and then you have a cross. That's the ministry of Christ, His life, His death, His atoning death on the cross. And then that issues forth a church age. Israel has rejected their Messiah King. Israel uh, has rejected the anointed one. They have put him to death. And Israel as a nation has undergone divine discipline and judgment. So God is now going to extend a different, a mystery form of the kingdom. And that mystery form is that the kingdom will reside in the hearts of men and women. Does not deny a future uh, kingdom for uh, fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. It just simply means we are in a new age, a new uh, era called the church age, where Christ is my king in my heart, not king in Jerusalem. And so consequently, in this view, Israel, the cross, then the church, and you notice that arrow coming down, arrow going up, and then another arrow going up. Above that, you could put capital R representing rapture, what many people call the rapture, from the uh, Latin word rapturo, which means to seize up or to take up. And so it's a good descriptive word of the church being seized up into heaven. Christ comes for His church, and they are seized up or raptured into heaven. That then begins the tri tribulation period. If you wanted to, you could write above that seven. The word, or the number seven, for the tribulation is a seven-year period unlike the world has ever seen before, described in graphic detail in Revelation 6 to 19. At the end of that uh, period, there's an arrow coming down. Do you see that? There you put capital S, capital C for second coming. The second coming of Christ. The, the rapture is the secret coming, if you will. The second coming, He comes to the earth to establish the thousand-year reign of Christ, the, to establish the Davidic kingdom, the kingdom promised to a descendant of David that He would rule forever over the house of David. And so you, he will establish on earth a time of unparalleled peace and prosperity, a time of social justice, a, a time of, 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 uh, of Hebrew shalom. Everything is as it should be. Uh, it's also a time, by the way, when Satan will be bound for a thousand years and only loosed until the end of that millennial uh, kingdom period. It will be a, an age, a golden age of blessing and prosperity unlike what we have ever seen. But there will still be one problem on the earth. And we have met the enemy, and it's us. The enemy of our souls, Satan is bound. It's a perfect world order, a perfect culture, but we are still sinful people. And all those who live in the millennial kingdom, who have children, those children will be born, just like every other child, uh, after Adam and Eve has been born, they'll be born dead in trespass and sin and will need to have their personal coming to Jesus, their personal faith. And some will trust in Jesus and some will not. And so that's how we will see at the end of the thousand-year reign, there will be enough non-believers that when Satan is loosed, he'll be able to garner one last rebellion, which will be crushed decisively, described in Revelation, 
It will be crushed decisively, and that will end. Uh, that'll move us right into the great white throne judgment, the new heavens and the new earth, which is what we put for the word eternity. All right, now that would be my particular view. <clears throat> and let me uh, just simply uh, acknowledge to you that beginning on the next page, which is page 217 at the top, I will outline with biblical passages that particular view. Now you might ask, well, why didn't you do it for the rest of the views? We don't, we don't have enough time. And they're also, th those are not my views. And so you're getting, you're getting my, my point of view, the point of view of the teacher. But in the chart back on page uh, 216, my view is not the only view of how panorama timeline could end. You could be the second one down. You could be premillennial post-tribulational. As we described it earlier, the church goes through the tribulation. That's what that arrow to the tribulation means. The church goes through the tribulation. That arrow down, arrow up, and then arrow back down, that's the rapture and second coming all in one event. So if you're post-trib, post-tribulational, you believe the church gets raptured, then it comes right back down to establish the thousand-year reign. <clears throat> and that's the way your panorama timeline would end, just, just like uh, the second view there. Mid-tribulation, the rapture occurs in the middle of the tribulation. The second coming is right before the thousand-year reign. There is a view, <clears throat> excuse me, there is a view called partial rapture. Uh, Witness Lee in the local church popularized it. It's not a very widespread, uh, widely held view. But Witness Lee, who was a, he was a disciple of Watchman Nee. Have you ever heard of Watchman Nee? He was a disciple of Watchman Nee. He came up with a novel view that Christ will return for His church, but only for those of you who are ready. Your hearts are right. Uh, you have no unconfessed sin in your life, and you are ready for the return. You've been watchful. You've been ready. You're in fellowship with God. And when the rapture occurs, if you are in fellowship, you get raptured. But if you're a true believer, but you are out of fellowship, you know, maybe you and the wife had some words, and, uh, and, and probably one or both of you are out of fellowship, you don't get raptured. But when you get right with God, then you get go up. So there are partial raptures as people get right with God, all throughout that seven-year period. I find that incredulous. I mean, uh, a person finds it, well, honey, I just want to tell you that I'm really, really sorry. There you go. <laughs> and so she would probably go, oh, okay. Uh, me too, me too. So, okay. Well, I, I, I'm making light of, well, I'm intended to, but I'm, I'm making light of it. I shouldn't. So, uh, so if the rapture, partial rapture occurs, I don't get to go because right now I'm out of fellowship. <laughs> All right. The evangelical postmillennial. Remember the postmillennialists? Things would get better and better and better. We usher in the kingdom. The gospel will make the world better and better. Well, the postmillennialist believes Israel and the church are the same thing. In other words, the uh, church is in the Old Testament concealed. It's in the New Testament revealed. But even Abraham who believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, was really a part of the church. Uh, I don't believe so. I believe Abraham was an Old Testament saint. I believe that I'm a New Testament saint, and we together are a part of the people of God. But that's my view. Evangelical postmillennialist says the church is going to establish a kingdom. It's getting better and better and better. Then Christ returns. The amillennialist, as I shared earlier, believes that Israel and the church are basically the same thing that the church age will include times of tribulation and times of Christ ruling in the hearts of men and women, but at the end, there's a second coming, and that's all. The one arrow for postmillennialism, the one arrow for amillennialism, is just simply the second coming, or they call it the parousia, the, the coming of the Lord. And I will not give C.H. Dodd the time of day. Let's turn the page. <clears throat> all right, we are now on page 217. And I wanted to at least give you some of my biblical support for my view. So what am I looking for? I'm a member of the church age. What am I looking for to move me into movement 12, the final consummation? The next event, the next prophetic event, in my understanding, is going to be when Jesus returns for his body. When, he, when the bridegroom comes for his bride when Christ returns for His church, for you and me. We call that the rapture. You'll notice the notes we have on page 217. 
the timing of the rapture is after Revelation 2 and 3. Notice how the book of Revelation is designed. Write what you have seen. That's the vision, chapter 1. Write what is going on right now, chapters 2 and 3. Then what's going to happen in the future? Yet to happen, yet to come. Uh, four, chapters 4 to 22. Hear this. The word church does not occur again after Revelation chapter 2 and 3. It only occurs here. Why? Because chapters 6 to 19 in particular describe the, the tribulation period, and I personally do not believe the church will be in the tribulation. Not because we're too good to go through stress and, and distress and persecution and all. We've been going through that all of the church age. But simply in God's program, God will remove His restraining influence, the Holy Spirit living within the hearts of His believers, the greater universal church. He will remove the restrainer, the Holy Spirit's influence in the world, and then things are going to go to hell, literally. Uh, the enemy will rule and reign, in a sense, over the earth. We will have incredible uh, uh, hellish events, uh, plagues and warfare and, and uh, death <clears throat> will be so prominent. But I believe that the church will be taken out. So for me, the next prophetic event that will launch the movement 12 is the rapture of the church. Point three, here are my pre-tribulational passages. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Christ died and rose again. Is that not the gospel? As short as you can, as short as you can define it. That's precisely how Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that Jesus died and He rose again. Now, there, there's a whole lot of meaning to that. He died for us. He took on our sin. And there are a lot of theological truths that are Velcroed to that simple statement. But He died, and then God resurrected Him to show His approval of the death of Christ. He died and He rose again. <clears throat> Notice verse 16. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be, notice the word, caught up. In Latin, rapturo. We get our word rapture. We'll be caught up, seized, snatched, if you will, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. All right? Or <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. In other words, we will not all die a physical death. But we will all be changed uh, in the twinkling of an eye, in an instantaneous moment. We will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. In the rapture and the seizing up is at, the, is at that moment you are purged of every taint of sin in your immaterial as well as your outer, your inner man as well as your outer person. You will be seized up uh, to be with Him. John 14, 1 to 3, Jesus is in the upper room. He's about to, uh, he's about to be arrested later that evening over at the uh, Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane. But He's telling His disciples He's got to leave. They're upset about that. And then Jesus gives these words, John 14, 1 to 3. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. <clears throat> Actually, that could be an imperative statement. Believe in God and believe in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? Of course not. But if I go and prepare a place, I'll come back and take you to be, and here it is, with me. Folks, everybody look at me for a moment. We talk about scholars' viewpoints and how's this all going to end up, and we, we uh, and, and we should. We, we're, we're wrestling with prophetic scripture, and it's always difficult to understand it. But here is something that you can go to either your grave or to your moment of rapture, and that is the best, most precious thing about heaven. I'll take you to be with me. 
Do you recall what they said this baby Jesus would be called? And you shall call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God in heaven, taking the initiative, send his son to solve the sin problem in order that once the sin problem is solved and later a new heavens and a new earth is established, that those believing people can be, as he would go to earth to be with them, he will then bring them off of earth into heaven to be with him. And heaven is not only a place, it's a person, and it's being with him. And he goes on to say that you may be where I am. Now, if you'll look on the right-hand side of the page, one thing we want to point out is that we said a few sessions back about Daniel chapter 9, verse 20 to 27, that that passage spoke of the coming of the Messiah, from the issuing of a decree, Artaxerxes' decree, from the issuing of a decree to, res to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, until the anointed one, the ruler, until the Messiah king, it would be uh, 483 prophetic years, and we targeted that right to the uh, triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem. But now you'll notice in that box deal, we have that dotted, those little dots. Uh, we, have a, we have a period where, because Israel has rejected their Messiah King, and because the prophecy of Daniel 9 is for Israel, Israel is now on hold, and their prophetic clock has stopped. And will not stop, and will not start clicking, will not stop, or will not start ticking, until they come to repentance and faith in in the Messiah that they have rejected. So, in that uh, dotted lines or dotted num uh, area there, we have one more number one afterwards, and that refers to the seventieth, the seventieth of seventy weeks in Daniel, a period of seven years. Each week equals seven years of time. Uh, a theological question is, are there prophetic signs to look for leading up to the rapture? Now, I've given you a quote. You can read it from Dr. Ellison later. But basically, it's this. No. We're on the launch pad. Uh, the, the, you know, the fuel has been added, and the smoke's coming down. We're just waiting for zero launch. And, and we've been sitting there waiting since Jesus returned into heaven. There are, in other words, there are no events we're looking for. Not even the return of Israel to the land is required. Now, once the rapture occurs, a whole lot of things have to be lined up, one of which is Israel needs to be in the land. But that's not what we would call a pre-rapture event to look for. It could happen any time. In fact, Dr. Ellison says he might... Uh, the archangel could be even be raising the trumpet right now. Wouldn't that be magnificent? All right, let's turn the page. Tribulation and second coming. Uh, <clears throat> I want us to skip down to the middle of the page, Matthew 24, just to give you a flavor of that Revelation 6 to 19 description. For then, Jesus says, there will be, here's, here's how you describe the tribulation, great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. It'll be the lowest, most difficult, most horrendous time in all of human history. Revelation 6, 15 to 17. Look down to the very last verse, verse 17. For the great day of wrath has come. In fact, it's the great day of their wrath. Uh, the people who are living at that time, and in particular, particularly the Jewish people. Jeremiah 30 spoke of it this way. How awful that day will be. No other will be like it. It'll be a time of trouble for Jacob, time of trouble for the Jews, a time of trouble for Israel. But Israel will be saved or delivered out of it. Now, let's go to the next page. What on earth would be the purpose of the tribulation? <clears throat> Here's the biggie, number one, point A. Repentance for national Israel. Israel has promises that have been made to them. Those promises are waiting for a repentant Israel in order for Israel to claim that which has been promised to them. But God will not give them their promises while they are in a state of rebellion and in a state of rejection. So the tribulation is going to bring repentance to the nation of Israel. We'll see this in a moment. 
Secondly, it will try and test earth dwellers. Whoever's on the planet, it'll be a time of great testing and trying where, uh, where things will get very, very clear. Either you have faith in God's provision of His Son or you do not. And so we will see that. Also, it will answer the theological question, who has the right to rule? Correct answer, God does. And even more specifically, Jesus has the right to rule over the kingdom promised to him through 2 Samuel 7 that a descendant of David would rule forever and at the end of his government there would, uh, there would be no end to, to his government and a time of peace. Also, it brings to completion what Luke calls the time of the Gentiles. We are in the time of the Gentiles. Israel is under divine discipline. We're in the time of the Gentiles. The issue is for us very clear. What will you do with Jesus? And so consequently, the tribulation brings to a completion the time of the Gentiles. Now, I, I uh, took that tribulation period and I just listed 10 common events in, in the chapter where you can find them. You've heard about the seal judgments and the 144,000, those Jewish evangelists who come to who, who come to faith in uh, G Jesus as the anointed one or the Messiah. The warfare, the beast, the bold judgments, all of that is listed for you right there for your uh, later study. Also, turn the page. In the second coming, <clears throat> notice I've given you a number of passages. Jesus in the Olivet Discourse said, oh, in fact, it, I, I started with verse 30, but I really should have started with verse 29, because verse 29 says, immediately after the tribulation, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven at the end of the tribulation period with great power and great glory. This is descriptive uh, of the second coming. Look, He is coming in the clouds. Every eye will see Him. This is not a secret return. This is, this is a visible public return. Even those who pierced Him and all the peoples on earth will mourn because of Him. Uh, as a matter of fact, Isaiah, notice that even those who pierced him, Revelation 1-7. Remember Isaiah 53-5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. The verse preceding that, and he was pierced for our transgressions. Speaking of the death of Christ on the cross. Prophetically, 8th century B.C., that prophecy was given. Or Zechariah 12, verse 10, listen to this. Because I think this is key to understanding that national Israel must come to repentant faith in the Messiah that their forefathers crucified and rejected. I want you to hear Revelation 12, 10, a prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. Hear it. And I will pour out on the house of David, Jews, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, I will pour out a spirit of grace... And please for mercy, so that when they look upon me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. In other words, when Israel comes to the place that they look upon him, the one they pierced and crucified, the one their fathers rejected, and recognize that they are perpetuating the sin of rejection, they shall look upon me, the one they have pierced, they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one who weeps for a firstborn. When that day happens, the clock will start again for Israel. And those promises made in the Old Testament, promises of a time of shalom, a time of peace, a time of prosperity, a time of justice, a time of equity and fairness, uh, a time uh, uh, of economic, economic uh, welfare and blessing for all. That will begin and that will be fulfilled in that thousand-year reign of shalom. But it has to be preceded by the nation of Israel coming to faith in the Messiah. What else will happen? Uh, Zechariah 14 describes it a little bit. The ultimate... Uh, Result of this, verse 9 of Zechariah 14, the Lord will then be king over the whole earth, over the millennial kingdom, where he will reign with justice and righteousness until that period of time is over. 
A little bit of insight, the second coming, it'll be sudden, unexpected, it'll be personal, and it will be visible. Now, <clears throat> we don't really have uh, time to go through uh, all of the passages, but on the next page, some of the consequences of the second coming of Christ. It ends the tribulation. There'll be some resurrection, some judgments at that time. The reign, the thousand-year reign will begin after the second coming. Satan will be bound for that whole thousand-year period of time. And then we will have that beautiful description, uh, that beautiful millennial kingdom, Davidic kingdom, a thousand-year reign as described in the Scripture. Now, we're coming up right now at a time of the season where somebody's going to quote or read Isaiah 9. <clears throat> Notice Isaiah 9, middle of page uh, one, uh, 222. For unto us a child is born. Merry Christmas. Right? You see it everywhere. Unto us a child is born. But we never read the full passage. A son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. Quick review of the life of Christ. When did he hold political office? When did he rule? When did he make decisions that the nation had to follow? When did he have the scepter of, of uh, a descendant of Judah to be the ruling tribe? The, go the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Verse 7. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Do you see that in the three and a half year ministry of Christ? No. Either this is mistaken, Isaiah's mistaken, or you have to symbolize it. Well, yeah, actually the government was in people's hearts. Is that what Isaiah was saying? Or is there yet future a time when Jesus will rule and reign? Of the greatness of his government and peace, there'll be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, 2 Samuel 7, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever, an uninterrupted rule of peacefulness. The zeal and passion of God will accomplish this. Or look at Luke 1, 32, the description of Jesus. This was a prophetic description uh, at, the, at the time of his birth. He'll be great, be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him what? The throne of his father David. He will reign. He will rule and reign over his descendants. His kingdom will never end. Or that Revelation 20 passage that we began with, which speaks of the thousand years, gives us an indication of the length of the millennial Davidic kingdom. A thousand-year rule reign of Christ on the earth. If you turn the page, we're almost finished. Page 223, there are a couple other passages that describe in glowing terms what the millennium will be like. The end of the thing is the great white throne judgment. And by the way, you have nothing to fear if you know Jesus. The great white throne judgment is actually for unbelievers, where it is validated that God is righteous and that people have uh, not chosen wisely or have refused to choose at all. And that they, their names are not written in the book of life because they have not put their faith and trust in Jesus. <clears throat> the, uh, that is to be contrasted to the judgment we will go through as believers called the Bema judgment seat. 2 Corinthians 5 and 9 says, Therefore we have as our ambition to please God. Why would I want to please God? Verse 10. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now that letter was written to the believers at Corinth. And by, by application, it's for all believers of all time. We will undergo a judgment not to see whether or not we get to go into heaven, but catch this, but it will be the, uh, what we have done for Christ in the life that we have been given. We will discover that some of the things we have done for Christ will be like Gold and silver and precious uh, metals and stones. Some of the things we did with wrong motives or, or impurely will be like wood, hay, and stubble, and they'll just burn up. No reward in that. The Bema judgment seat is where he will dispense his rewards for the way we conducted our lives as believers in Jesus. By grace have we been saved through faith. 
and that not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for the purpose of good works. Faith in Christ, by grace through faith, salvation then leads us to a life of serving Him and serving our fellow man for the cause of the King and His kingdom. And that will be judged at the Bema judgment seat. All right, we have on the next page the new heavens and the new earth. I want you to notice point two as we finish on page 224. The key contrast. Humanity began in a new world in a garden, Genesis 1 and 2. Everything was perfect. There was no sin. It was all the way it should be. And humanity one day will end in a new world, in a new place. Revelation 21 and 22 describes the creation of the new heavens and the new earth, which we will populate in our resurrection bodies. For heaven is a place as well as a person. And we will populate our, the planet as God will recreate it. We will populate it in our, our untainted, unsinful uh, resurrection bodies for all eternity. The key answer to the big question... Who has the right to rule? Well, folks, you have to answer. I can only answer for me. Who has the right to rule and reign? Not only in hearts, but on the planet. <clears throat> Maybe we hear the words of Jesus. Behold, I'm coming soon. We call that imminently. In other words, there's nothing holding me back. I could come any moment. The question is, are you ready to acknowledge me as the ruler and the reigner of your life? He will reign human history. He will reign over the millennial kingdom. The huge question is, can he reign in your heart? And you hold the answer to that. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heaven. Praise Him for His mighty works. Praise Him for His unequaled greatness. Praise Him with a blast of ram's horn. Praise Him with lyre and harp, with tambourine and dancing, strings and flutes, clash of cymbals, loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that breathes sing praises to the Lord. God's people would say, Amen. Amen. Or if you're a boomer, cool. Or if you're a millennial, Awesome.